And good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Welcome on into the Dragon's Den. My name is Digital Dragon. I'm your host for this evening. Welcome on in, Bio Nick. Uh, not no good. Welcome on in. Glad to have you all here. Thank you for coming out. I know it's uh, kind of what the day after Christmas, so it's going to be a little bit slower on the show today. Uh, but thank you all for coming in. Hey, Zombie, how's it going? How are you doing this evening? Hoping you got uh, everything you wanted and more for Christmas. Uh, if you're like me, it's probably a lot of electronics and 3D printing stuff and all of that. Bye, Nick. Welcome in. Welcome in. Yeah, so we did get a couple of things. A uh, couple of things uh, that were, I'll say, a surprise. Mostly clothes. Well, there you go. Every once in a while, we need clothes. Um, but uh, yeah, I, we, we really don't, you know, we just buy the things we need throughout the year. So really Christmas is just more time with the family. Um, I did get a couple of Christmas gifts that uh, uh, I wasn't anticipating. And thank you for the individuals uh, that are out there that know who they are that sent things. So thank you very much. Um, and also, hey, Pez Liz, have, happy Boxing Day. That's right. There is a Boxing Day today. It is not uh, boxing as in traditional, you know, two guys beating each other or two women beating each other up. It's uh, it's actually like dealing with like boxing things up. Is that correct, Pezlas? Don't know the full details behind it, but I do know it's not the boxing that people think of. Um, but yeah, speaking of boxing and unboxing, um, I did get a, uh, shipment in from Westry One. Uh, for those of you that know, I did win a 3D print from Stephen Poole on Westry Stream, and that has come in, and I will be unboxing that. If she does pop in tonight, I will run downstairs and grab it and unbox it. If not, I'll wait until Thursday and try and do the unboxing on Thursday for that. Because that's, it's kind of cool. And it's, it's pretty big, it's pretty substantial. So, but welcome on in. Hope everybody had a wonderful day. Um, we, so today is Tuesday, which means we're back to the Annex Engineering K3. Hey, Major Gaming Geek, how's it going? And... Uh, we're going to start today, we're going to kind of step back a little bit, try and finish up the tool head, which means we're going to put together our Sherpa Mini. Now that I got the gears in, we'll put together the Sherpa Mini and try and finish off the wiring and stuff up on the tool head. And then from there, we'll continue on on the uh, backpack and working through the backpack. Um, I still need to make some decisions on the bed. That's why we're not going to tackle the bed just yet. We'll wait. Uh, probably until Thursday for that because we've got to just figure out <clears throat> do we wire in the secondary thermistor uh, rather than go with the um, oh what do they call those the self-resetting thermostatic uh, uh, temperature sensors um, and do with the hard ceramic you know break because that way <clears throat> If we if we don't do that tonight, or if we don't do the thermostat or the um, ceramic fuse, then what could happen is you have a runaway SSR that's that's locked into the on position. It heats up to 150 C. The resettable fuse trips and expands, and then as the bed cools down and gets below, I believe. Uh, like 100 or something like that, maybe 80 C, it will fuse back together and it'll start immediately heating back up and just get into this heat cycle, uh, which is leads to other issues. Um, so I'll, I'm thinking about that one still. But what we are going to do is we are going to get to go and or get going and get our Sherpa Mini put together. Um, and we will go from there. So I will switch screens over here. 
and we've got our layout of the parts required. And for the most part, that's pretty much laid out here on this paper towel. We got a couple more things like the K front end, uh, a uh, extra washer piece that you could use if you're not using the Bontech one, but we will be using a full Bontech parts kit. Uh, that we got from KB3D. And as far as the screws go, I'm just going to go grab those out of my button head cap screws uh, that I've got from numerous other builds. We'll just dig into those when needed. And assembly. We're going to start off with some heat set inserts. Um, there's two of them that go in on the core piece here they come in from the back side so we'll install two here at the bottom and then on the main core piece we're going to go two top and bottom and then we're going to go one in the side and this will hold in the idler arm in this specific um version um has uh, allows for an ecas press fit fitting to go into the top and it also has uh, spot here to mount a end stop and you would mount an end stop here without the lever just the little plunger pin on it and what that'll get used with is a secondary screw that'll go through the hole up here and you'll set it so that when there's no filament in there the idler will close and it will trigger the end stop when you put filament in there, the um, idler bracket pushes out ever so slightly, and that will untrigger the end stop, and that will give you your filament run out sense. So we'll need this um, capability um, down the road when we go to install the trad rack on here. So. Hey, Pete, how's it going? Welcome on in, my friend. Welcome on in. We're just getting started. We're going to do a few heat set inserts, and then we're going to start putting together our Sherpa Mini um, uh, extruder that we'll be using on this build. Um, you can use the Sherpa Micro. I've always used the Sherpa Mini. Uh, I know some people like the Micro better than the Mini because you have greater access to the main um, plastic gear so you can manually load your filament. But I've always gone with the Sherpa Mini versus the Micro. I think it has just a little more torque and oomph, even though it's the same gearing and stuff. Um, I think it's just a little bit better. And then there is a new version that they're coming out with that is going to be the, I think it's nicknamed the Sherpa Heavy. And instead of using a NEMA 17, or excuse me, a NEMA 14 pancake stepper, it uses a NEMA 17 pancake. And down the road, I may swap this out for one of those. Excuse me. Been fighting with that one for a little bit. Sailfin, yeah, Sailfin is pretty close to a Sherpa Micro as far as size and weight. So I've seen it used. Uh, I just I've never installed, you know, built and installed one myself. And hey, Nick, Nick, thank you for the resubscribe and for five months in a row. That's awesome, awesome. So we got the two in the front. Now we need to do the one on the side here.
And that would be all of our heat set inserts that we're going to need for that. Go ahead and put that down. And folks, I'm going to mute you real fast. I'll be right back. Uh, thank you for all the hype there, Major Gamer Geek. I just need to blow my nose. Give me one second. Sorry about that. Thank you. Okay, so, and once again, thanks uh, for the resubscribe there, Nick Nick. I really appreciate it. Um, so we've got our heat set inserts in. We need to test fit our bearing into this rear piece here. So we'll take one of our this is a MR85 bearing, make sure that it presses in to that back piece, which it does. No problems. Next up, we need to double check and make sure that our rear is not more than 26 millimeters. And I could depth mic it, but I'm just going to do a quick eyeball here, or excuse me, 2.6 millimeters. We are going to have to depth mic that because I can't figure 2.6 out. I'm just going to push that out, lay the edge of that depth mic right up against it, push it down until it bottoms out. And our reading is 2.72, but we're going to check that again. And there, zero it out. Now I come back with 2.68. So we're close, but not fully there. Let me see what I got here. Now, then, let me just take a look. So, once again, what you're trying to do is make sure that when this seats in to the bearing, that it doesn't protrude past the plastic there. And as long as it's down in there, not protruding plastic, you're going to be good because what you're trying to do is prevent it from rubbing up against the face of the motor. And that looks like we're still going to be good. And if you do, if you do want to sand it down, if you're, if you're really concerned about it, you can sand that down some more. Um, I suggest laying sandpaper flat down. Hold this as flat as possible, just like a top, and do a figure eight motion on the, on the sandpaper to try and sand that edge as flatly as possible to make sure that it, it does remain good. So this talks about using the uh, rigid or rigda um, gears which means this would be press fit on versus um, this older style in which we would use a set screw. 
Um, I don't have the rigged gears, so we are going to still use the set screw on this. <clears throat> and we'll just go from there. Um, the rigid, rigged, however it's pronounced, are the new gear styles. And like I said, it is a press fit gear that gets press fit onto the, uh, the shaft of the larger plastic gear and therefore increases the overall uh, concentricness, concentricity, whatever we want to call that, of the I kind of love these small, small nut screws. Okay. We've got that set in there. This piece comes in from the back. And you'll notice that it should be lining up directly with your filament path. And that's with the, the metal gear pushed all the way back onto to the uh, plastic gear. You'll slide this in there and it will line up perfectly with the filament track. Now we'll take the rear piece and just sandwich it on there, making sure that the bearing um, goes right over the rear end of the shaft. Once again, the shaft is not exposed out the back. And we're going to need two. M3 by 16 button head cap screws. And yeah, the with you doing the tap changer, it's all basically BMG gears. And, and are you running sail fins on that? Or are you running um, <clears throat> like a CW? Or, or are they all like mini stealth burner tool heads? Okay, so we got those two clamped together at the bottom. It says to run some filament through to line up our filament path. So let me come down here and we'll just grab a little bit of our filament. Always good to have some spare filament around, end of rolls, or whoops, just snap that in half, or um, pieces of um, sample spools always work well. This is just the end of a spool that I'm just going to pop a short piece off. Try not to snap it this time around before putting it in and just using it as an alignment tool. Coming down right through the top, right through the bottom, and you're making sure that it's nice and lined up, which it is. 
And then I'll tell you to tighten the set screw, which we've already done. Everything's nice and aligned. An M3 by seven by, so an M3 half millimeter shim, which is optional to go on the end. Um, I think we should have some of those in here. Do we have M3s or were they all M5s? They were all M5s and that's gotta be a five anyhow. That must be a typo. Or, that's right, you're using the Orber V2s. There we go, nice. Um, yeah. And are you doing the, uh, are you gonna do the filament sensors on them or just the, just the uh, standard V2s with no filament sensors? I guess you wouldn't need a filament sensor per se. I mean, not for a, like a tool changer or MMU style requirement, but you can still use it as filament runout sensors. That, and they've got really good load and unload macros, that's for sure. We're gonna need some of our grease, like we normally do here. We're going to um, just pack our bearings with a little bit of grease. We're gonna do that. by leaving our needle bearings in our other gear. So our needle bearings are in that gear. We pulled out our little M3 um, uh, shaft. We're going to squirt some EP2 grease in there. And then we're gonna reinsert that shaft and as it starts to push some of that um, grease in, you're going to see this first idler start to pop out. And so what you'll do is take your fingernail, hold that idler in, and your other one's holding the other end. Then you're just going to slowly push this in. When it gets to the other side, it would have... Oh, had I not dropped it, I still that I dropped it. Yeah. Now, had the needle bearing stayed in, which it did, um, those bearings are now packed with grease. Or is it trying to go things on camera? And you see, I got a little bit of grease there on the big gears. That is perfectly fine. It will help it mesh, but I want to make sure there's not an excessive amount. I'm going to try and work some of that off there. And on your idler, when you go to put this on your idler, your idler's laying down um, with the pivot joint on the left and the top of the idler on the right, the larger side of the gear is facing you, the filament side is facing away from you. So it's going to fit down in there like that. And all you do is get it lined up and pushed in until both sides snap. Throw our syringe of grease away.
and then check her or check to make sure that your idler is spinning and it's not hanging up on anything, which it is. And for this part of the assembly, we need to take our um, idler piece. Set it down in there, making sure that our gears are aligned and meshing. We'll need another M3, and this is an M3 by 22-ish millimeter um, long shaft. And that's going to go right down here and be the pivot point. It's probably going to be a little tight. So that's what we're looking like so far. We need to put our other MR85 bearing in our front cover piece. Just make sure I got the right one, which I do. Our bearings down there, make sure our bearing lines up. Push it on the end of our um, shaft, and then we need to make sure that our bearing for the um, idler fits into the other side of our A front piece here. Which, in my case, it's just a little bit tight. That's good. Thing seems to be lining up. Here's a rotating. And we finish out the front with two M3 by 8 button head screws. Well, the nice thing is they'd be easy enough to add in, I'll say kind of after the fact. Um, yeah, give me one second. I will be right back. I do need to grab uh, a tool. So give me one second. We'll be right back. Put the grease up while I head down there to grab that. And welcome on in, Chewy. Welcome on in. So you might have seen me using some pliers on one of the last streams, being the standard slide lock pliers um, with the tooth jaws, right? A little bit harder to use, um, 
stands the bit or stands a chance of messing up a print. Well, somebody saw it and decided to send me a Christmas gift. And I now have a set of three Nipix. Um, these are smooth jaw, and so they have the push down in the front that allows you to slide and open them up to whatever you need. And they are smooth jaws, so there's no chance of marring apart. So. By giving me these, and we're going to try and use one of these just to make sure that we get our pen fully in and seated. Just a nice, gentle push. You want to make sure that your pen doesn't go through the back piece here. You also want to make sure that it's fully seated in the front because once again, that is the pivot point for your um, extruder, your idler. So that's your tensioning mechanism that will be used on your idler gear. And speaking of the tensioner, we'll take our screw. It's going to go in through the slot. We'll go in through the slot. Driving home from work. Well, be careful, Chewy. Hey, shenanigans. Welcome on in. Everything seems to be meshing well and working well. So far, so good. We're still doing good. And the long leg here will actually mount to the party plate. We've gone ahead and added our tensioner. Now we need to add our motor. You'll notice on one side we have a hole and the other side is a slot. So the slot's gonna be the, the um, locking side and the adjusting side, this is gonna be the pivot side. Now with the way that this goes on the printer, Okay, so this is a, a nice set of Nipix. We've got all three sizes. So once again, our push button to allow for the adjustment and smooth jaws on both sides so you don't mar any surfaces up. So these will be good to have for the for the uh, tool, you know, added tools into the toolbox to make sure that we don't mar up things on our printers down the road. Those down there so I can trip over them later. And then we're going to need an M3 by 12 button head. Welcome on in, Kit Skyfire, uh, Stephen Poole, Solar 3DP. Welcome on in, gentlemen. This is a 12 kit. Once again, the right side here is going to be the quote unquote pivot point. The other side is going to be the adjustment point. And what I wanted to do real fast is see how this is going to sit and It sits there, it sits there. I'm gonna run the wires up so that I can get a little bit of a service loop in them. If I run it down, I'm gonna be tempted to try and cut them as short as possible. And that way, if I ever have a problem with this motor, I'm gonna have really, really short wires, which will probably not be a good idea. So M3 by 12, and then the other side is another M3 by 12. 
and we're going to start, we're just going to get the screw started. We'll have a little range of adjustment here. Right? Not a whole heck of a lot. But you don't want it jammed down on the gears, which will make the gears hard to turn and will by extension lead to um, additional fatigue and some uh, just badness. It, it'll bind, it will require more power to push, and then of course more power to push will mean uh, the chance of breaking things. So gently apply pressure. You don't want it to be like slam down engaged. You want it to have a little bit of play as you switch directions, but not a lot. And it should be running smoothly. You shouldn't have to really apply a lot of pressure to run the motor. When you're happy, go ahead and lock it down in there. Give it another little test. It's working well. Talks about maintenance, but for now we are pretty much done with that. Um, we do need to put in our ECAS fitting. That's going to be pretty darn good. Welcome home, Julie. Welcome home. The extruder is aligned. I probably should have put in the um, the ECAS fitting before getting everything assembled because those can be slightly pain in the buttish, for lack of better terms, to get installed. But we'll work on that here in a second as I did get a whole bunch of ECAS fittings in as well. I just have to figure out what I did with them. And they're not jumping out of me at plain sight. So, we will just go ahead and continue with our install and we will play with ECAS fittings later on, possibly off stream. It'll kill me if I've lost these as well because, like, it's a hundred pack. How do you lose a hundred pack of ECAS fitting? I Means chances are I didn't lose them. I just am not seeing them right off the bat. So let's bring our printer back up here onto the bench. where we can work on our party plate install. All right, page The tool head. Sorry about that. Oh, hey, it's Pezlis. Thank you for 
I need to read words sometimes. Um, let me see. Let me back up here just a second because I see a, a hype train is imminent. Um, happy Tuesday. Welcome home, Chewy, who just got home. Solar 3DP gifted a tier one gift sub to Pez Liz. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Solar 3DP, for that. Um, Pez trying to figure out what to eat for supper. Createx Brit, welcome on in, Brit. Welcome on in. Solar's going to have some soup. Uh, Chewy fell on your knee today. That's not good, Chewy. Get some ice on that and, you know, sit down and get that raised and get some ice on it. Hope you feel better. Um, 100 pack is easier to, than you think to lose. I'm sure, Chewy, but like I said, it just came in. So it's got to literally be right here on the top visible somewhere. I just need to keep looking around for it, and I'm sure I will find it like right after I go off stream. Because that's how it always happens. Um, Otter Danger Den. Yeah, exactly, you can. And there's the hype train incoming. He has right next to those bearings. Dude, I have still yet to find those bearings. It, I, I'm at a complete loss as to what happened to those bearings. Complete. And we are into a level one hype train. So let's just come over here and chat for a little bit. Thank you guys for getting a hype train started. Pezzle is cheered 100 bits. Um, shenanigans with 200, zombie with 100. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, you've been icing it all afternoon. Well, good, but if you've been up on it all afternoon, that still doesn't help, Chewy. Take care of yourself, my friend. Check your pockets. Yeah, they're not my pockets. Pez just cheered another 10 bits. Thank you. They're on the floor rolling around. You know what? They could be. And there's another 10 bits from Pez List. Thank you so much, Pez. And then another. So I see Pez is on the slow roll of gifting bits here. She likes to give little small amounts and just keep it rolling. Meanwhile, I'm just going to keep looking real fast for these ECAS fittings. Up, up, up. More, more, more. You know, I'm like, where would I have had the ECAS fittings? Well, I, I use them in my trad rack, so let me just take a quick look at the trad rack box, which is where I put them at. See? Easy enough to find. You just have to think through it. Zombie, thank you for the 10 bits. Pez Liz with another 10 bits. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, I missed your, uh, your stream last night, Zombie, so I need to kind of check out and see what your build's looking like. Because I have a feeling it's going to be really, really cool. So, ECAS fittings found. ECAS fitting going to get installed. And getting the little... Uh, blue pieces, the, the actual pallets into the, into the ECAS clip itself. So you've got the black piece, the gray piece, and then a blue piece. The light blue piece goes in the middle of this. The black piece comes off pretty easily. Trying to get this blue piece in is like god awful crazy trying to get those pushed in. And getting them pushed in straight, which would always help. Would always help. I think that's going to be a case for my new Nipix as well. Yeah, a pair of vice grips. I'm going to break out the uh, Nipix so that I don't uh, 
damage anything since I just got these new Nipix. And we'll try and give them a go. There we go. And when you go to do that, it's it's definitely easier to pop the little black rubber piece off when you go to do that because the little black rubber piece is just going to squish around for a bit and just kind of make things a little bit of a pain in the butt. But it should go back on there fairly easily. Do that and then have problems doing it, but that's okay. Went in there. All right, all right. Yeah, the Nipix are nice, especially, like I said, these are the smooth jaw ones. And uh, yeah, it was just really, really nice. So the hype chain completed, and it was a 60% of a level one hype train. We had one gift sub and 460 bits. So thank you everybody for that, I appreciate it. So when we come back over to our build here. All right, thanks for the lurk, Solar. We've got our, our um, carabiner plate, which once again, we've got um, heart cooling fan, hot end fan, probe, and this is the heater thermistor into a four pin uh, Molex Microfit 3. And then we've got our other part cooling fan, the motor from the extruder, and then our umbilical cable that will go back into the backpack. So we're gonna set this on. Just kind of get this set in place. I'm gonna raise you all up some and remember which way it goes. Kind of raise you up and then tilt you down so that you can hopefully see what I'm working on here. So our umbilical is going to sit right down in here and our connection pieces are going to sit down in there, which means that our wires here need to be plugged in before we actually um, set anything down on there based on where they're going to go. So our part cooling fan, which is this side over here, would actually connect through this cutout in the party plate. So we've got to take that piece and plug it in first. Okay, then our probe would go in. So when I go to do the end stop for the filament runout sensor, um, I'm still trying to check and see if I can use the probe and get it plugged into the probe. If not, I'm just gonna have to take that and bring it back with the umbilical. Um, but this piece will go in there. Our hot end fan and then our hot end wires are gonna be on the front side of the plate here. So we'll be able to plug this in. I could have made these wires just a tad bit longer. Turn them the right way, they'll go, they'll actually go on the pins easier. That's plugged in, and this should be able to sit right down in there. Now, once again, we still need to fix our microfit connectors here, and then that'll plug in to this four pin microfit connector here. Our other part cooling fan comes around and connects to the front there, and our extruder is going to sit right on top of here going through a adapter plate. 
which will be where? Here's our adapter plate, and it's made so that it'll sit right across the front here. Our extruder is going to sit right on top of the adapter plate. I'm going to need some PTFE tube that's going to go all the way down through here and into our, our uh, hot end. Recommended to use authentic bond tech. It does not tell me how much tube to use. If it did, the manual is based on a mosquito, which we are not using. So, what we do is we're going to use our depth mic again. Make sure we get zeroed out. And we're going to mic how deep our the bottom hole is in our um, extruder. And we're going to say that that is not a correct number. Eight millimeters. So I need approximately eight millimeters of length exposed above the um, the adapter plate here. So what I want to definitely do is make sure that we've got a full four millimeter um, gap there. Three and five, so four is probably still the one in there. And it sucks getting old. And all I want to do is make sure that this hole is exactly four millimeters because that will make inserting a PTFE tube all the way down into our hot end a little bit easier. And I'm really more concerned with the very bottom where it was on the print bed. Because that's where I would get the um, that's where I would get any elephant's foot or anything that would cause me some issues trying to get a length of PTFE tube in there. And once again, we want to be using a standard like 
two millimeter inside diameter tube here, not a three millimeter. This is not going to be a Bowden or reverse Bowden setup. We get down through there nicely, which we are. Down through there, down through our PCB, through the party plate. And that's not working, so. You don't have leftovers. Oh, dang. We didn't have leftovers either because we didn't bring any home from my parents' house, which is where we had our Christmas meal at. Those are nice and tight. Okay. That's all the way down there. We'll have the party plate. And yes, I know I am feeding this very, very weirdly in here. And then our adapter. And it will basically need eight millimeters above that adapter. Okay, so that is our cut point. And just like all of our other printers, we'll cut it. We'll do a little bit of a chamfer on both sides just to make it a little bit easier to feed our filament in and get our filament out when we're doing filament swaps. Because once again, your, um, your filament will get a little bit of a 
blob at the end of it. Unless, of course, you're using a bamboo or something that has a filament cutter. Hey, Talise, welcome on in. Welcome on in. Uh oh, we're starting to talk about the cocoa press again. And the fun and joys of failed prints on a cocoa press. I still say that there's no such thing as a failed print on a cocoa press, just a happy accident. Because either way, it's still going to be a snack. It's just... First, go ahead and take our filament and just run it through a couple of times to make sure that any potential for filament obstruction is fully cleared out. And we'll need to get this pressed down in there again. I do not understand why it is that hard. There we go. Out. Goes in. Let's see. Here we go. All right, Spruder sits on top there. Line it up with the PTFE hole or the PTFE tube. Set it on there. Two screws through the top, one through the front, and we should be good. And that's uh, M3 by 25. That button shows socket. That's awesome. Uh, M3 by 25 with a little bit of Loctite on it. Bill Prince, you give to the kids, yep. Hey Aaron, welcome on in. How's it going today? Hope everything's going well. We are working on just putting together our extruder and getting our extruder installed on here. Now we've got the right party plate. Then we did our extruder build.
from the prints I was seeing, it was looking like he was getting some successful prints off of it. So I hope it's going well. And we're going to move this so that we can get a better angle in there. Okay, so that's installed and that's nice and tight. We need a M3 by eight button head screw for the front. Also with just a little bit of VH or VHB, a little bit of Loctite. This is going to go through the printed part and into the um, heat set insert that we added to the front of the party plate there. And that's going to lock everything in place and make it really, really rigid in there. So once again, we'll have a couple of more cables to cut and crimp. And we're going to do micro fit for the thermistor and the heater wires that will plug in here. Um, this one is the other fan wire. And I'm coming around the side here. The motor wire is going to plug in right behind the motor, which might get a bit interesting. And like I said, I'm not going to start off with um, a filament runout sensor on here, though I can add that a little bit later once I decide to do the um, trad rack install for this. And of course, our ECAS fitting is a simple press fitting down into the housing there. Just like that. I should have done that before installing it on the printer but there we go so that's there um let's spin this around a bit kind of figure out how much motor wire we need not too much We go with these. Let me put these back down here. Oh, not a problem. I try and cross pollinate everything over to YouTube and it's funny because I'm starting to do some searches and finding my own content on YouTube, which is pretty interesting. Um, not something I was expecting, but. You know, so we'll just uh, clean off a little bit of this wire. And of course I can't use these because they don't go small enough. So 
But yeah, I've got, I think, close to 50 videos I need to watch on YouTube just because I haven't been keeping up on content over the holidays. But, you know, you got, you got family here. But I am going to try and squeeze in a couple of additional streams here and there. So just keep your eyes open for those. I'm hoping that we can get this build done and get a move. Well, get this build done. We're getting close to getting the 2.4 for Chewy um, into the final stretch. And we'll be having both of these printers at least moving under their own sooner rather than later. In fact, both of them I think are just going to be soon bed and electronics, so... Um, it's interesting, Chewy. You know, like I said, I, I was not expecting to be finding my own, you know, myself in search results. Um, like maybe for a bug bill or something like that, because there's not that many, but doing a K3, I realized there's not a lot of people out there with K3 builds, um, on, you know, YouTube or anything like that. So it's pretty interesting to to see them. And apparently I need to stay up on um like short form content because like my most watched video is still the um the serial request video for the zero G Mercury, if you can believe that. So oh, let me. Switch that over. And we'll come in here, we'll print four wires and hopefully get that installed here shortly. And then we'll be able to put this aside, knowing that the tool head's finally we'll say complete. Um, we won't have the filament runout sensor, like I mentioned, but that's a that's something that can be added later as well with no problems. So well, that was good. Small motor wires. And that's the second one that I knocked off. That I don't know where it went, so we'll have to flip the printer over. 
knock that one out. Yeah, I'm kind of more thingy out and build as well, Aaron, but I try and talk my way through some of it just to help people along if they're doing this build or if they're following along or there we go. Trying to get over my apparent healthy fear of wiring on stream, I guess. What I'm doing here is um, because of the size of the connector, it's easier to go with the um, I'll say start off with the third spot, which is 1.3, and then I'll recrimp over the wire at the 1.0, and that's what's going to get me the tighter crimp to make sure it's good on the wire because once again these wires are pretty darn small on these motor wires so you want to make sure that you have a good physical contact because that means you should have a good electrical contact when you're doing these crimps And a lot of us have chased bad crimps, you know, trying to diagnose motor issues. So it's always good just to make sure that the crimps are really good. And that goes with factory crimps as well, because I've had factory crimps that have been for crap. And especially on hot ends for some reason. I don't know if they had a bad machine in bad machine, bad QC, what the deal is. But I know of a few uh hot ends that have had some crappy crimps on thermistor wires. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's definitely good and bad crimp uh, pictures out there. I'm hoping that I show up in the, well, these are passable, mediocre, not going to burn your house down crimps. And I say that, but I just, I, I've gotten some really, really good crimps. I think I'm getting better at it. It's just like anything, you, you do these builds, you haven't you haven't done the uh crimps in a little while, and the first couple of ones take you know a little bit like boom, that one was just I'll say shit hot. And then there's other times where you just feel it and you're like, oh that's that's not going to be a good one. <laughs> okay. Um, I always try and look at my wires because at least that way it's a good starting point as far as whether they're, they're paired up the same way. 
because um, this is the way they were at the factory. You cannot go just by colors. So that's why I go by the same order that they were applied at the factory. Because um, that means at least if, it, if the pairs aren't in the right order or the pairs aren't, um, I mean, you can tone them out, but if the pairs aren't matching, well, they weren't going to be matching out of the factory either in this case. If I, if I uh, crimp it or if I install them in the jacket just the same way they were from the factory. So I can at least go back and say, well, the factory wouldn't have worked right either. Come on. Where are you in red and then blue. And on a recent stream, uh, I think it was a Saturday stream, when we were doing Chewy's build. We talked about um, how to tone out the wires or, you know, test the wires. Like just split two of them apart, hold the two connectors together before you put them in here, and just try and spin the motor. And if the motor spins, then the two that you're holding together is not a pair. And the two that you're holding apart is also not a pair. So then you just start making combinations until you find it where there's some resistance or I'll say some a grindy type feeling in the motor. And that will be indicative that you found one of the two phases. And then the other two would be the other phase. Oh yeah, I know. I we're always our worst critics. And I know that there's going to be other people out there that um will just say get more practice than I do because they crimp more often than I do. Um whether they're in a service industry where they're doing crimps or if they're in a uh yeah. You know, if they're an electrician or. Now I'm going to fight my wires here. Like I said, probably would have been better to push this one in there prior to mounting the motor, but it's in there. That was a joy. Now we'll be able to install our umbilical and that will go to the backpack. And the more I think about it, guys, um, with the backpack, we're thinking about, do we move the backpack to the side? Do we run the backpack on the back and basically just mount the front door and the, and the right side panel and just switch them? So in other words, the... So this is the back of the printer. So I can mount the backpack here and move the front door from the front to the right side and just move this right side panel over. So I'll have the door here and the backpack in its normal position on the printer behind the Z axis. That could make it a little more difficult when you're, when you're looking at the printer because it's gonna be X and Y unless I go and change a lot of things. And a lot of things would be changing the position of all of the um, end stops, right? Or we can simply move the backpack around to this right side, move the right side panel to the back, and we'd be good to go home free, no other changes necessary. And we would still be looking at the printer through the front door, which is, would be this orientation for everybody, right? So that's kind of the thing. Regardless, I want the, the backpack or the electronics to be on the right-hand side of the printer when you're looking at it. Because that's going to allow me to put the 7.9-inch display on the front. 
Okay. So my thought was put the backpack on the right side, leave the front door on the front door. That way the printer is still moving and looking the same exact way without having to change anything else. It's just more of a physical layout change than having to do anything else. And yes, there are some really, really nice crimpers out there that will do both the insulation and the wire at the same time. And those are great. Don't get me wrong. Those are, those are fabulous. Um, I've gotten used to using these. And these are the iWIS. The, they're now known as, I think, iCrimp versus iWIS. iWIS. Um, and I may go and get a new pair just because I think some of these teeth are starting to wear down. I've been doing so many crimps with it. So I may be investing in a new pair of jaws. Or at least like new pair because this isn't a replaceable jaw one. Um, but yeah. So we've got our extruder on everything except for doing our, our micro fit connectors here for our hot end. So I don't know why that was shrink wrapped together. Kind of weird. Must be a shipping transit thing. Yeah, like I said, I got, they're called iWIS, but um, they're now iCrimp, I believe, is the name that they've changed to. Um, and Steve Builds has an actual, like, model number that he's put up or called out on a couple of videos. Um, and it would probably be good to always, you know, like, have a spare set and build a I'll say to go bag with tools because that way, like if you take your tools from your workbench, go to a show, something happens, you forget them, you leave some behind, you loan them out, they never make their way back. Then you get back to your shop and now you've got to do repairs on a machine and you're out tools. So it's always worthwhile to have more than one pair. Like I had a, I wound up having a, uh, like a, a full duplicate set of tools at the house and at the hangar for stuff when I was building the plane, except for tools that were like $500 a piece. The, those I would drive back and forth. But, you know, the standard regular tools, I wound up having two sets, uh, one at the house and one at the uh, hangar when I was building out the hangar. I, you know, don't get me wrong, Chewy, I like doing crimps, and except for those really, really tiny ones on the SB2209. Um, I like doing the crimps. It's just... Um, sorry. Uh, it's just... Um, I, I guess it's doing them on stream. It's kind of where it's like, eh, because you just, it feels like there's other people watching you and stuff. And for me, it's a relaxing thing to do. Just kind of sit down at the bench or at the desk and just go, you know, bag cramp. Okay, great. If I start having a bunch of bag cramps, then it's like, okay, I, I'm out. I'll, I'll stop and go do something else for a while. Um... And I don't want to, like I said, make this too tight. I want to be able to have some type of service loop in here. But.
there's those two. Regardless, this is a single four pin versus a two by two. So, you're kidding me, this kit doesn't have a four by um, to -da dum to dum. Is there a micro fit in here? Not in here. This is all JST, of course. I'm going to need to find a four by um, micro fit. It'll take me a second, but we'll find it. And eventually I'll take all of these JST connectors and put them in with one of my other JST kits because I've got like two of them. And I'll stop working out of the little baggies. Because believe it or not, that'll make it easier to find the parts that we need. It's all JST and DuPont. Another set of all JSTs. There we go. There goes Zombie spilling his coffee again, making a mess everywhere. And let me cut this over real fast. Uh, now I have it put on there. Now I got to figure out which order this goes in. That way, and lock, and of course, that means the two thermistor wires are on the clip side. I'll have to re verify that again. And I may wind up taking this fan off just to make it easier to work on these because it'll be easier to put that fan back on.
two socket heads, one button head. It comes out, scoots out of the way. May that one stay in there. Peter Warner's. You gotta be careful that you don't rip your heater wires out of your heater because that would be bad. Okay. Two heater wires exposed. We'll put those on pins and then we'll do the other two. Gonna look for a bit, maybe get one of those prime ribs that picked it. Ooh, nice. Nice. Yeah, we had chicken, um, drumsticks for lunch, cooked them in the Instapot, and I've got a ham from a wild boar that my sister-in-law got down in Florida. So I will be cooking that here probably tomorrow. Um, Those two are done. Now we need to do our um, thermistor wires, which are great because they're in that little uh, fiberglassy type insulation. Hey, shenanigans, welcome on in. Yep, yep. So wild boar is just a, uh, just a pig that gets uh, roaming around on its own. They are a nuisance animal and will tear up the ground pretty much anywhere. And when I say tear up, I do mean tear up. They eat the little grubs and everything that are in the ground and they will root through the ground and just destroy land. Hence why they're considered a nuisance animal. They'll kill all the vegetation, they'll eat all the vegetation, they're omnivores so they will eat anything and everything. So, yeah.
This is the same thing as the JST. It's two uh, distinct crimps, one over the bare wire and then one over the insulation. Um, pretty simple and straightforward. Like I said, same thing that we were doing before. You've got the tool, you can do both crimps at the same time. I've just never done it that way. Okay. Now, once again, I'm just going to go in there like so. Click in. Triple, quadruple check where that clip is. Yep. So, once again, that this fan is going to be a pain in the butt because that clip is going to be right there in the way where that fan where this one uh, screw goes. So I may have to take this screw out and just have the fan held in with three because otherwise I won't be able to get this connector in. If this was a button head screw, that would work, but alas, it is not. So, thermistor, blue wires. Thermistor is on the clip side. And you got to make sure that these go in, in the proper orientation and that they get seated all the way because if they're not, they can and will pop out. So if you need to, help them along, especially on these wires that are, I'll say, smaller and gentler because they keep... Uh, uh, bending. I'm going to have to get in here from behind and help them along. Make sure that they seat fully. And that means that my two thermistor wires go the same way. And the way these go in is these, they have these little like wings on the side. If we can get this to focus, maybe, maybe not. There's little wings on the side of the connector there. 
and these wings actually have to be side to side so that they go in and catch in the connector housing right. That's what you see me keep trying to insert it and pull it back out as I'm just trying to get it in the connector housing in the correct orientation so that everything will line up and hold appropriately. Now it goes up and clicks. We will swivel our fan back over into position. We took out one of the of the bolts for the hot end cooling fan because it would it would be in the way of latching this clip for the thermistor and hot end. Make sure that our wires are kind of out of the way. Tucked in there. The other thing that we'll need to do is install our beacon probe, uh, which will go into the back base of the tool head. And we'll just wind up running the USB cable from that all the way directly with the umbilical and just add it in. So that'll be easy enough to do. Microfit connectors. Does an error. And normally I would say just chuck this, but we do want to make sure and realize that our thermistor is a 104T on this particular hot end. So maybe we'll hold on to that for just a short bit longer, just so we can remember that in our minds if that's a 104T style thermistor. So our tool head is is all wired up. Um, got our board, everything's wired up. Like I said, if we go to add our end stop here to make our filament runout sensor, we could just run that wiring all the way back through the umbilical and have a separate wire for that. That shouldn't be that big of a deal. Um, your phone does not act as a mouse, so let's grab the mouse. Yeah, the bore should be pretty good. I mean, it's it's a pig. It's going to be ham. Um, so it shouldn't be that bad. And it, I've got a small roast. We're down on page 135 ish, somewhere around there. Yeah, so we are working on the backpack. So let me go ahead and take the printer and set it down for the time being. And let's grab the backpack that I was mocking up and I'll show you kind of where we are at on that. So for the backpack, I'm going to bring you guys back down to earth a bit. out of the way, move this back over. So what we've got is a dual UHP power supply setup. So we've got a UHP 224 volt at the top, and we have a UHP 248 volt at the bottom. So the 48 volt is going to drive power, which is two pins, positive and minus, into our uh, Supernova Constellation board. So this board is, well, hell, let me do, let me do this. I'll bring this over and turn that one on. 
There we go. So this is the Constellation Supernova here. And this is a board designed by Annex Engineering. Sorry, I'm just trying to make sure that you guys can actually see that. There we go. And this is a four motor board. So what we've got installed is four Big Tree Tech 5160T Pro um, step stick drivers. Um, these are going to be running in. Um, are they running? Uh, yes, SPI mode. All of them are set on. So these are running in SPI mode. These capacitors are rated at 63 volts. That's why we can use these. That means this board can take up to 56 volts of input. We're only going to be providing 48. No sense in going higher than that. Oh, very nice, Rodney. Um, and so what will happen is we've got our Constellation board. These four are going to drive our XYZ motors, which are going to come in through the top here. Um, well, it'll come in through these two smaller grommets on the side. Our umbilical is going to come through the middle and go into a breakout board, which is this board right here. This is a, what is it, 16 pin breakout board. So we're going to have probe, motor, um, fan, fan, um, not my bad. Probe, motor, chamber thermistor, um, hot end fan, cooling fan, the thermistor, and the, um, actual hot end. So these will break off of here and come down to the main controller board, which will be right here. Now, this is a mock-up board. This is an SKR 1.3 board. It could be used. There's, there's no reason why I can't use this particular board other than it doesn't have a lot of fan inputs, right? Um, you've got one fan input here, one here, and then the other one you're tying into a hot end. So it's, you're going to have to treat it as basically like an always on, or that would be tied to your actual, um, it'd be PWM. So you can put that against your hot end to set it to start up whenever your actual hot end triggers above 50, right? Um, what I've decided to do is I purchased a... SKR3 EZ board. So that will come in. It should be the same layout as far as the uh, uh, dimensions go. Uh, if not, I can, I can flex this just a little bit, no problem. But we'll set this up and this way we'll be able to bring all of our power into the one side, our three stepper motors from the base down here will come up. I'll, I'll probably daisy, or not daisy chain, but cable chain them, bring them right up and go into the Z motors. And then the one of these will be the extruder motor for the Sherpa Mini. Um, so this is just here for mock-up duties. The fans are gonna be over on this side the SSR is going to mount directly here on the edge of the um, extrusion. So I don't need a SSR, you know, like a metal SSR den rail mount. We're just going to mount it directly up to the extrusion and allow that extrusion to basically act as the heat sink for our heat sink and grounding point. So this will mount up something like this. Um, so load would be up here, inputs down here. It'll need to be mounted like this um, or like this, one of the two. Um, I just need to figure it out, but this will be pulling 24 volt. So this is the 110 side. This is the 24 and 48 volt side over here. So all of my 
lower amp voltages will come up here. The 48 is going to be direct connected to this board. Just simple run right up the side to this board. The 24 I'm going to bring over here into a breakout and then come up to the board just in case I need to run anything else off of 24 volts or do some other type of buck or step down converter for anything else. Okay, um, yes, yeah, so 110s over here, we'll be bringing our motor wires up and running them right in this trough, bring them up, plug them in. Um, yeah, it's kind of what we've been working on. Um, the, let me bring you guys back out a bit, so shut this one off. So bring you guys back out a bit and... Connector panel wise, we're going to have our fans on this side and they'll be connected in, right? Probably joined together and then connected into a CNC fan so they can be managed. And over on this side is going to be the 7.9 inch display. And the Raspberry Pi is going to mount to the back of the display. Okay, so the Raspberry Pi is going to mount right here. Um, the Raspberry Pi is going to need a 5-volt source. One of the reasons why I looked at the um, uh, SKR3EZ is it does have a 5-volt, I believe it's 5-volt, 5-amp power capability. So we should be able to run the Pi directly off of that and the screen. And if I need more juice, then I'll use the same type of DC to DC buck converter that we've used on V zeros. And that's where my 24 volt Wagos will pop in because we'll use one of these, which is a 24 volt to 5 volt DC to DC converter. And that's 5 volt 10 amps. So we'll get this mounted somewhere in here as well. Maybe just VHB right to the back or potentially we could drill in, you know, drill a couple more holes into the back, provide the screws up and just screw it down. It, you know, there's options there where we'd be able to bring 24 volt up, five volt out to, to power the um, screen and the Raspberry Pi. Now the Raspberry Pi is going to be connected to both the Constellation and the controller board, the, the main MCU board here. And we're not going to be doing any CAN bus. It's just going to be direct connect um, over USB. So. Correct. It's using the 2020 to provide stiffness and to be able to give you better mounting options um, and a little bit better rigidity to the backpack. Because on a DIN rail, you can mount something to the DIN rail. On a 2020 that's mounted on a flat plate like this, you get three sides that you can mount to. So I've mounted these two hanging on these brackets basically from the bottom side. I mounted this to the top and I could come in and mount other things at the top if I needed to. So it gives you more options on ways and where you can mount things. Um, 5 amps should be plenty. It's a WaveShare 7.9 inch display and the Raspberry Pi itself. I don't know how much it's going to pull if, if it I'm going to try and direct connect it to the SKR3, which will replace this board. This is just here for mock-up purposes. So it would replace this board. And if it all powers great, awesome. If it doesn't, then I have the, the, the breakout option here. Um, so that'll just make things easier. And then once again, this has magnets in the four corners and a plate that'll sit right over the top. And it does have plates that go across the top and bottom as well. I've just left them off. 
and I'm going to run a couple of links. What my thought was was going to be get my um, high voltage wiring done here and get my 24 volt coming up plugged in, my 48 volt coming up and plugged in, and then I can close in like probably the bottom, maybe the top, just to add some more rigidity to this plate. Um, while I run the rest, but I wanted to do that on the bench because once again, it'll probably be easier for me to take this off to do the wiring over here and then I can put it back on after the fact, but I'm definitely going to need to get my plugs inserted, get it turned on, get power to it, make sure I am getting 48 and 24 because the last thing you want is to go to plug, you know, components in and wind up, okay, I'm not feeding it 24, I'm feeding it like 20. And, and I've got things that start going wrong because this isn't set right at the factory, right? Um, but yeah, that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, the display isn't due to be here until Thursday. So the display and the new um, SKR not an SKR E3 Mini, it's an SKR 3 EZ. So it, um, on the SKR 3, here let me try and pull it up some. Move a couple things around. So you just get a web page up. So the Big Tree Tech. So it's got the easy drivers, right? And it's got larger caps. So the larger caps will let you run these at 48 volts. So if I ever wanted to drop 5160s, I have the option. I can get more of the step sticks or I can get the EZ drivers because this board will take either or. Okay, let me switch it this way. So it can take a regular step stick layout or it can take the new EZ drivers, which would be the vertical standups. You've got one, two, three CNC fans, but you've also got two up here in the uh, motor lineup, or actually there's three up here in the motor lineup. So you've got six total fans that you can pull from. Now by default, the all of these will, well these three are all the VNs. So whatever you've got going coming in is what those will run at. The three down here beneath the stepper drivers will be VN, so 24 volt, or you can switch them down to 5 and 12 volt by adding a little board um, between these two four pin connectors and you can set a jumper to make them 12 or 5 volt. But it's they're all 12 or they're all 5. So that's how you can get around that. Um, you have motor in and then board in and, or I think this is motors in, um, your heaters then DC in and the heated bed out. That's kind of what you've got there. Um, you've got your EXP1-2, you've got your end stops, you've got your filament runout detection pins, you know, your standard RGB, TFT. Um, this is a, you have the ability to add a Wi-Fi module, um, CAN modules, the whole nine yards to this. So this is really good. Um, say read more and drop down here to the description. So the power chip adopts the TPS 54505 amp, which supports 1224 volt power input and can output up to five amps. Peak of six, um, which supports the power supply of Raspberry Pi. So that's where we should be able to power the Raspberry Pi with no problems. 
going off of the board. So, yep. So you've got um, a boot button, so you can put it in DFU mode to flash it. Um, this also supports PT100, PT1000 uh, thermistors. Um, all, it supports all the SPI and LCD screens, so we should be good there. Um, doesn't matter because we're going to be running it off of the, the screen off the Raspberry Pi. Um, upgrade the configuration firmware through the SD card. Onboard Diag pen so you can use uh, regular um, end stops or centerless homing. Based on this build, we're going to be doing centerless homing. You have an SKR Easy board around here somewhere? Yeah. So I've got the SKR. So this is the SKR 3 EZ. I also have an SKR E3 EZ that's plugged into the Ender XY build. But once again, it's that board and the, the like the SKR Mini E3 V3, they're designed for the Ender 3 which means they're hobbled by the number of fans, and the fans uh, are normally not voltage selectable on because they're expected to be drop-in replacements. That's why I decided to go with this board over the E3EZ, which I could have just plucked out of the other one and kept going. Um, it supports 2209s, 5160s, 2208s, 2225s, 2226s, 6609s. So there's all kinds of drivers that you can run in these. Um, yeah, so lots of good that can come from here. Once again, you've got filament runout detect for both E0 and E1, so extruder 0 and extruder 1. You've got power detection, so, you know, power blips, it can recover. Um, you've got the probe and the servos, so you'll have the ability to run like a BL Touch or something like that. Um, we should be able to go into the probe pin. Well, actually, we go into a filament runout pin if I add the filament sensor to this. You've got bed thermistor and hot end thermistors and once again these support the PT1000 that's what these little resistors are right here uh, right under the probe pins you've got the TFT port um, I believe not your I can't remember what that one is you do have a jumper so where it says optional voltage of jumper, it says optional voltage. Uh, let me explain that. You must select a voltage, either VIN or you're like 48 volts. So it's either going to pull whatever you're sending to the board, or if you're sending something like 48 volts over the dedicated motor port, you got to select it one way or the other. I found that out on the E3 EZ board because if you don't put a jumper on there at all, it will not work. You'll take TMC errors because the TMC aren't getting power at that point. The motors are unpowered. Um, can take up to 48 volt on the driver or on the uh, motors. That's because they have the bigger rated capacitors. Um, the robust power system, once again, this is the 5450. This provides uh, 5 amps at 5 volts to feed your uh, Raspberry Pi. There are a potential for two different um, STEM32 chips on this. It's either the 743 or the 723. They just run at slightly different clocks or uh, megahertz speeds. You can use either step sticks or the EZ series. I'm gonna be putting TMC2209 step sticks on that board. If I want to switch up somewhere down the road, I could, but majority of all my stuff is step stick.
Once again, you can put higher voltage on these, but your driver must support it. Don't put a TMC2209 in there thinking you're going to push 20, 20, uh, 48 volts. It will go pop. And yes, this is what I was saying, is selectable between 24 or 48. you got to have a jumper on these for the motor to work or for the driver to work. Otherwise, it's not getting power at all. It does have isolation chips for your steps, uh, stepper drivers. And this is what I was saying, that there is a little DC mode board that you can plug in. And then using the jumper here, you can select between 5 volt and 12 volt. But that is for the three CNC fans. So that would go between these two four pin connectors right here. And that sets the voltage for these three fans. The three fans out here on the motor stack are always going to be 24 volt or 12 volt, whatever you put into the board. So three CNC fans, three normally open fans. So those three fans that are over there with the motor drivers are always on. The only ones that are CNC fans are the, are the three over here by the actual power inlet. And these are the only ones that you can change, but they have to be one or the other. They're either all 5 volt, all 12 volt, or all 24 volt. Oh, let's see. Anything else? I think so. Once again, you can add an, a Wi Fi interface to the board. I don't know why you would. Um, the Wi Fi interface is still pretty anemic. And if you're going to have a Raspberry Pi to run Clipper on these, anyhow, that's it's kind of useless. It's only really useful if you're going to be doing Marlin and they're slow. Like uh, trying to use Prusa Link and update or uploading files to my Prusa Mini or my Mark IV, it's just slow. And that's what it is. That, that longer connector next to the TFT. So you've got your TFT display right here. This longer connector that's right uh, next to what looks like stepper motor, but this would be for your Wi-Fi module. This longer connection is a CAN FD uh, capability. You should be able to run regular CAN, but you're only running high low. And you, you, you know the CAN FD. This board does support RepRap firmware, and CAN FD is is only supported under RepRap firmware. Your kind of silk screen. And everything that comes in the box. So yeah, that's what we will be using as the actual uh, MCU for this build is the SKR3 Easy Board. Um, so yeah, we'll be using that. And then like I said, if I need to... You know, 5 amp should be fine to run the display and the Raspberry Pi. If I have any voltage drop issues at all and start getting an under voltage error, we'll just slap this in and do a uh, 24 volt to 5 volt because this can support up to 10 amps. So I shouldn't have any problem powering the Raspberry Pi from that. Um, and then what else? I think that's kind of it. And so now, really, all I really wanted to start doing was setting up and starting to do my wiring for the 110 side of the uh, power inlet here. So what I'm going to need to do is, is mount my lower piece here, grab a couple of 
parts, like I should have my filtered inlet somewhere in the switch because I know I had one of those for this build. Let me find it real fast. Going to mute you all real fast while I dig through a box in here. And I'm back. Yeah, I'm definitely going to need to clean up the uh, clean up the old shop here sooner or later. So my plan is to use the filtered inlet. which does not have fuses in it, of course. Now I gotta remember where I stuck my fuses at. So has anybody gotten anything new for Christmas that they uh, want to share anything about? Like anybody got new printers or new filament to try? Yeah, let's go digging back in the box again. Oop, nope, maybe not. There we go. Fuses. Now I had a couple more. Christmas was in July. Oh, I got you. Got a P1S and mini fridge. Oh, sweet, Ronnie. That's awesome. 
And we know that uh, the party is going to be at Rodney's house from now on. We used to have a mini fridge um, back in the day when I worked at the office and then when I was in Colorado and then when I moved back east. Uh, who did we, I can't remember if we gave it to somebody at the office or if we gave it to the, one of my boys. But it was definitely a, yep, we're... Uh, we're not bringing it here because it made no sense to bring it if we were moving into an apartment. Yeah. New fuses would be such a pain in the butt to get put in. Hey, Phantom, how's it going? Mr. Sneaky, sneaking in. Acting like he's been here the whole time. How's it going, my dude? Hope you're having a, a good day. You had a good Christmas. At least a good holidays. We're trying to do it that way. It's not going to work, so... I have to go back to turn it the other way. Um, I have not verbally spoken with Westry, but I am aware of what's going on. I do need to probably reach out and give her a chat, though. Give her a call. It would have been better, but not bad overall. Good. Yeah, we, we had a good time. We, uh, we went over to my parents' house and had some good food and played with our great niece, which is always nice. It's always fun to play with the little ones. New wallet and a dash cam. Yeah, but are you allowed to have anything in your wallet, Aaron? That's that's the big question. That's the big question. She just posted it to Twitter? Okay. Um, I will be reaching out to her then. Because I am aware of something that is going on. But uh, that's not going to work. We'll need a bigger one. You never carry cash? I I get you there. I pretty much don't carry cash at all either. And when I do have cash, it's it's normally um well 
Yeah, we'll just go with, I normally don't carry cash. And when I do, I really, I'm not aware that I have cash, if that makes sense. It was kind of a pain in the butt to get seated, but that's the seat in there. See, new slip jaw, smooth jaw, Nipix uh, pliers are coming into use, being useful right out the gate. Thanks again to the individual that gave those to me. Uh, that was really awesome. Yeah, what cash? You know, I have cash on me because my wife gave me cash. It's funny. She's like, give me money. I give her money and then she gives me some back. And it's normally a lot less than what I gave her. Um, but it's all good. I mean, that's why we're married, right? That's why we're married. They keep us in line. They keep us out of trouble normally. And in my case, you know, not giving me cash normally keeps me out of trouble because then I can't spend as much. No, I'm like Aaron, you know, a lot of my cards are in my Apple Pay, so. So this is going to mount down here. This will mount here with the actual switch module in it. And once again, oof. So this is gonna be facing down. Off towards the, what do you think guys? Off towards the printer or away from the printer? So the switch is going to be sitting down at the bottom. Do I want it facing the printer? Or do I want to swap it out and put it on here so the plug's back here? That might be the better option actually. That might be the better option to have it back here on this back panel so it's reaching over well, it's either front or back. I'm just trying to figure out how it would be easier to shut it off. Right, because normally your switch is in the lower back of a printer and it's vertical, so I always want to be smacking it down to shut it off. If, I'm, if I need to shut it down for some reason, I want to smack it down and shut it off. So here, that switch is either going to basically be a side to side or if I put it in the back, it'll be a side to side versus a vertical. So which way would be easier? You think down towards the base of the printer or away from the printer? Like reaching around and pulling it out. I think we'll do it that way and we'll do off is towards the outside or away from the printer. That's kind of tight right there. We are going to have to move this to the back side here because this is going to be way too tight where these are. So we'll need to swap those two panels. Yes, from your bank to your partner's bank. I don't even do that anymore, two wolf designs. Really, if, if my wife's like, hey, I need some money, it's Zell. Zell or something like that, because it gets to her almost instantaneously.
Here, we're going to have to do it like this. Even that's going to be tight in that corner. And there's kind of a part of me that, you know, I wonder if it wouldn't be easier to have a couple or three den rails in here. Because you either do like two very vertical long den rails or like one, two, three. Oh no. That might be an option for something down the road. Okay, so if we're going to do that. <clears throat> And all of our electrical is going to be right here. Our AC is here. And, and I'll be seriously honest with you guys. I actually thought about taking this and flipping it so that the power supplies were right here. And that opened up stuff down here at the bottom. But once again, we're still going to have the same thing of how do we get stuff routed from here to here? Because our all of our uh, X wires are coming down here. And there's no way of getting these around here without taking them um, up and over our... Uh, or thingamajig. And if we surface mounted this, or for that matter, if we VHB tape, a short piece of den rail here mounted that on den if we needed to mount something like this we can mount that on den we can take our we need to leave this here or mount that that gives us at least an alleyway that we can create for wires and makes it easier to get to the 110 wiring around here No, I don't know, I don't know. Any thoughts? Because we're going to have to come from the switch here to the switch over to our AC Wagos, and then out of our AC Wagos down here for the power, because this is our 110 over on this side.
So let me think. And I think what I'm going to need to do is just get some wire in here, do some of my jumpers, and then think about it from there. Once I get some of the initial jumpers in, then be able to try and see how this works. Because there's another part of me that's like, if I could put like uh, load neutral on this side, ground on this side, then that may help clean some of this wiring up. But then again, it may not. I don't think it will. I am thinking a little bit of den rail VHB to the uh, to this piece here may make it easier because we can mount our um, SSR to that den rail. Make it easier for that from a wiring perspective. Open, you know, free up this corridor right here to be able to run some wires through there. I think that's what we're going to do. Okay, Pete, thanks for your, hanging out with us for a while while I sit here and muddle through thoughts of wiring. Because once again, the, the wiring for this is pretty much left up to you. It gives you some suggested layouts, but it's pretty much left up to, you know, us to figure out how we want to do it. So like, here's the suggested layout, right? And that's good, except for... It shows using a different um, power supply and one that, uh, you know, it's a full 24 volt system. You're not running the two separate controllers like this and some other things. So, you know, and even that it's, here's kind of the, the way it looks. And then it's, it's up to you to do all the, the wiring, right? There is no real wiring in here. It's left up to you. So we'll continue, uh, or I'll continue to think about that. Um, I guess for like build wise, because once again, I think we need to go until at least nine ish um, to see some other people come on. Give us some options. Actually, let me take a quick gander to see who is on. Yeah, a few. My go-to Createx Brit is is on there. Um, we have Profit DNA. We haven't jumped over to Profit in a while. And what might they be doing? Looks like they're talking about some stuff that they got for Christmas. Never a bad thing. Um. Yeah. So let's go ahead and. Uh, I think we're going to raid out now. Um, yeah, I think we're going to go ahead and set up to raid out. Uh, we're going to raid into Profit DNA and check them out. And I will probably also go over and listen to Createx Brit a little bit while I go downstairs and hang out with the fam. Um, I'm going, we're going to continue to work on this build on Thursday. So I'm going to get in here and like I said, kind of look at the wiring and plan through some of the wiring in my head a little bit more. And we'll either be working on some wiring on Thursday as much as we can or working on building the top hat so that we can also start putting some panels on and we can get all the other panels on and start working through that. 
So thanks everybody for coming out. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the renewed gift subs or the gift subs or the renewed subs and the bits that came in this evening. And like I said, let me get a raid started out to um, Profit DNA. We come back over here. I think they were an option on my stream manager, which would make it easier. So we're going to go ahead and get that raid started. Um, please come with me, hang out for a little bit on Profit DNA, and uh, we will see you guys again Thursday. Thanks for being here. Uh, Phantom, thank you. Major Gamer Geek, thank you. Pete and everybody, Rodney, uh, Pezliz, Zombie, um, and Aaron, everybody else that was here that I probably didn't name, Scott L., Thanks for being out here. I'll see you again on Thursday for another couple of hours as we continue to work through this build. And if I pop in some tomorrow, I will definitely try and give you guys a heads up that it's going to happen. So thanks all. Have a good one. And we'll see you later.